Hi, my name is Andy Friedman. I'm an attorney with the law firm Friedman, Rosenwasser, and Goldbaum. Today we're going to talk about franchising your business. This presentation is brought to you by the Small Business Development Center. So we're going to look at both the legal and business aspects of franchising your business. So before we do that, let's look at what constitutes a franchise. What is a franchise? A franchise is a method of distributing or selling goods under a uniform method of business practice under a common trade name or trademark. So the franchisor licenses to the franchisee the right to operate a business using the franchisor's trademark and the franchisor's system of operating a business. So from the franchisor's point of view, the advantage is to grow your business, number one, using someone else's money, so you, you can preserve your own capital. Uh, you don't have to hire people to run a, an outlet or a store that is in a remote location. You have franchisees to operate the store. And the franchisee has a vested interest in the success of the store, so they typically will do better managing a, their own store than a manager would manage a franchisor's company-owned store. So clients come to me and they ask, well, is my business franchisable? And the answer in most cases is going to be yes, because there are so many different types of businesses that are franchised today. Uh, some of the examples on the slide include uh, accounting services, advertising services, there's uh, children's services, you've got business to business franchises, business to consumer franchises, um, service businesses, retail businesses, etc. So there's a, a whole range of businesses that can be franchised. Some of them are full-time, some are part-time. To ask is your business franchisable, uh, the answer is usually yes, but, and what I've got on the slide here is a uh, misnomer there, it says requirements, but it's, uh, uh, these are just some of the important factors that, that you're going to want to look at to see if your business is franchisable. So the first one you've got is it, is it a profitable business? Because if you don't have a profitable business yourself, you've got nothing to franchise, in my opinion. So secondly, can you duplicate your existing business model? Uh, we refer to that as a cookie cutter model. So in franchising, you want every franchised business to operate the same way that you operate your company-owned businesses. So when you go to McDonald's in, in, in Idaho, it's the same as your McDonald's in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, so can we duplicate what you've got? The next uh, requirement, so-called requirement, is, is do you have the time and the capital to invest in franchising your business? I always tell my clients, when you start to franchise your business, you're actually getting into a different business. Let's say you're already in the restaurant business, you're operating a restaurant, and now you want to franchise that restaurant. Well, you're no longer in the franchise I'm sorry, you're no longer in the restaurant business, you're now in the franchise business and it requires different skill sets, it requires different capital requirements, and it requires a lot of hard work. So you have to be, pre be prepared to that. Um, another aspect of franchising is you have to be willing to give up some control over uh, your trademark and or your business operation. So you're going to allow someone to operate a business using your trademark, you have to trust that either you have taught them well enough and trained them well enough that they will operate it in the manner that you uh, require and number two you're willing to give up some degree of control. Uh, now I had a client a couple years ago that came to me and they wanted to grow their business and we discussed different ways of growing the business and other than franchising there's other ways you can do licensing you can do distributorships and uh, there are other ways to grow your business but in this particular case the client was not willing to give up control. They, ha they had a, a particular proprietary product and they would not even license a third party to manufacture that product for them. And they did not have the manufacturing capacity to grow the business uh, otherwise. So they were stuck where uh, if they're not willing to give up some control over manufacturing the product, then they're not going to be able to ex expand their business, which is fine if that's, that's what they want to do. But if you want to franchise your business, you're going to have to give up a little bit of control. Okay, some of the other things that, that we need to have, you need to have systems. Franchising is all about systems. Um, Ray Kroc recognized that when he saw the McDonald's, uh, the first McDonald's stores, and, and what it's all about is creating systems and efficiencies, and like I said before, a cookie cutter 
approach to being able to duplicate your business. So if you don't have systems in place for your business now and you want to franchise your business, then my recommendation is that you go back and create systems. So to make your business fran franchisable, to make it cookie cutter, to make it uh, duplicatable, if that's a word. Um, Another thing you're going to need is, is some sort of uh, training and operations manual. Now legally, a franchisor does not have to have a training manual or an operations manual, but almost every system has one. So you want to be able to have in, a, uh, in writing, in a manual, everything about your business, how to, how to, how to open the store in the, begin, at the beginning of the day and close it at night. So uh, all that has to be in writing, your recipes, if, if it's a, a restaurant or uh, uh, any kind of proprietary information. Uh, it's all going to be contained in a confidential operations manual that you will eventually give to the franchisee and by which the franchisee is going to operate their business. Uh, likewise, you're going to need a training manual because you're going to need to train these franchisees on how to operate the business the way you want them to operate it using your trademark. So these training and operations manuals are very important. Uh, it may be that you can prepare these yourself. Quite often there are so-called franchise consultants out there that will uh, for a fee, uh, prepare these uh, training and operations manuals for you. Um, another thing you need to consider before you start franchising is uh, what, your fr what your website looks like. Uh, typically, uh, you're not going to have a franchise tab on your website yet, but you're going to need to create one. And you may need to or want to create an intranet for your franchisees. Uh, depending on, your, on, on the type of business that you operate, you may need some significant rework of your website, uh, which are going to need to budget both in time and money. Um, and finally, um, if you're going to franchise, you're going to need some franchise-specific marketing material. So probably now your marketing material is, is geared toward getting new customers for your business. Well, now you've got to change your mindset a little bit, and your marketing material is going to have to be geared towards uh, getting franchisees, getting franchisee prospects in the door. Okay, so those are uh, the quote requirements, as I uh, I say, to start franchising your business. So you need to have all those in line. So now let's talk a little bit about the laws that regulate franchising. So franchising is regulated at both the state and federal level. Under the federal law, we've got the Federal Trade Commission rule on franchising that covers all franchise sales in the United States. And what the FTC rule on franchising is basically a disclosure requirement. So the rule requires that you disclose 23 different items of information in a particular format in quote, quote plain English um, that the franchisee will be given uh, at least 14 business day, I'm sorry, 14 calendar days um, before they can either sign a binding contract or give the franchise or any money. So it's like a cooling off period. Let me give you a, a list of some of the things that are included in that disclosure document. And uh, the first item is just general background information about the franchise or any predecessors, its affiliates, how long you've been franchising, how long you've been in the business that, that you're trying to franchise. So that's some background information. Item two talks about the background, uh, basically five year employment history of the franchisor, their uh, officers, directors, and people with management uh, responsibility. That has to be disclosed in item two. Item three, the franchisor has to disclose litigation uh, that relates to either a violation of uh, franchise laws, uh, securities laws, fraud, things like that, or any material litigation. Now certainly if, if the franchisor has litigation with its franchisees or is being sued by its franchisees, that would have to be disclosed in the disclosure document. So uh, it's one uh, maybe a deterrent for a franchisor to get involved in litigation because they're going to have to disclose that in a disclosure document and explain it to a prospective franchisee. Item four uh, talks about bankruptcy. So the franchisor has to disclose whether it or any of its officers or directors have filed bankruptcy in the last 10 years or any company with which they were affiliated filed bankruptcy in the last 10 years. Not a big deal to me. Item five, the franchisor has to disclose the initial franchise fee and any other fees that the franchisee has to pay to the franchisor before the franchisee opens for business. So typically that's an initial franchise fee. May also include uh, some franchisors uh, include a quote startup package, which might include inventory, uh, furniture fixes, equipment sometimes are purchased 
from the franchisor. Sometimes they're purchased from third parties. So all of that would be included in item five. So that's pretty simple. Item six is a chart where the franchisor has to describe all of the fees that the franchisee will pay to the franchisor over the life of the franchise agreement. So that's typically going to be, again, the initial franchise fee, the ongoing royalty fee, the marketing fee, if there's audit fees, training fees, uh, uh, renewal fees, all kinds of fees, whatever it is, that has to go into item six. Keep in mind, again, this is all in plain English as well. And item seven is probably the most uh, useful to a franchisee prospect because the franchisor has to provide in a chart form all of the expenses the franchisee might incur or expect to incur um, in opening the business and operating it for the first three months. So that's going to include, again, the initial franchise fee. It'll include construction costs, leasehold improvements, deposits, advertising, signage, uh, software, hardware, uh, licenses, attorney's fees, you name it. So, um, and this is, uh, uh, like I said, very useful for the franchisee because it's going to give the franchisee a range of uh, dollars that they're going to need and know they're going to need in liquid uh, capital to start their business. So item seven is one of the more important ones. Uh, item eight, the franchisor has to describe any restrictions on the goods or services that the franchisee will be selling. So typically the franchisor might have certain proprietary items that the franchisee must purchase from the franchisor or from sources designated by the franchisor. So uh, this is important. The franchisee wants to know where it can buy its uh, inventory, where it can buy its equipment, etc. And there may be restrictions where they have to buy from the franchisor. Item eight um, also includes the, a table uh, for the training, so the franchisee will know how long the training program is, what's involved, what subjects are taught, and who is teaching uh, the training seminars. Um, some of the other, uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, some of the other important uh, sections in the, uh, or items in the disclosure document would be items 12 and 13 regarding the territory and the trademarks that the franchisor owns. Um, from a franchisee's perspective, they want to make sure the franchisor is the owner of the trademarks and that they're strong trademarks. Uh, with regard to territory, I think we already discussed that um, the franchisee is usually given some exclusive or semi-exclusive at least territory within which to operate their business so that they know they're not going to have competition from the franchisor um, or other franchisees in the system. And then I'm going to skip over to, to item 20, which is important. And item 20 contains five different charts of information about how many units the franchisor has, and, and, and particularly over the last three years. So you get to see how many, the franchise, how many franchises the franchisor sold in the last three years, how many franchises were, were terminated, not renewed, uh, things like that and then ultimately how many franchises the franchisor expect to sell in the next 12 months. And then the uh, last thing I want to touch on is uh, the financial statement. So in item 21, the franchisor has to provide audited financial statements on the franchise company. Actually, uh, the last three years worth of audited financial statements. So if you're the franchisor, you want to keep that in mind. You're going to need to have and, and budget for audited financial statements each year. From the franchisee's perspective, uh, they want to know that the franchisor is financially viable and is going to be around for a couple of years uh, to support the franchisee's business. At the state level, you have approximately 15 states where you have to register your franchise before you can offer a franchise in that state. So there's a registration fee, a filing fee involved, and there's usually a, a, a government administrator that reviews the franchise agreement disclosure document, um, might require some modifications, an addendum to the, to the disclosure document or the franchise agreement, and then you register it, uh, and then you can start offering franchises in that state. The other laws that regulate franchising are what are called relationship laws. So some states have laws that regulate the relationship between the franchisor and the franchisee. For example, it, uh, the state law may say that the franchisor cannot um, fail to renew 
a franchisee or cannot terminate a franchisee without, quote, good cause. So those are some of the relationship laws. Uh, but the bottom line is, uh, the first thing you need to do is figure out, am I a franchise? So you look at the definition of a franchise under the federal law, and it's a pretty simple three-step process. So the three elements of a franchise under the federal law are, number one, the licensing of a trademark. So the franchisor is going to license to the franchisee the right to use the franchisor's trademark. That's pretty simple. It's pretty going to be prevalent in, in, in all situations, probably. The second element is the payment of a fee. Under the federal law, the fee is $500 or more. So if the franchisee is required to pay the franchisor $500 or more between the time they sign the franchise agreement and, and open for business, then that meets the second element of the definition of a franchise and um, you go to the third element. So the third element is a little bit more subjective. So if the franchisor either exerts or has the right to exert significant control over the franchisee or if the franchisor is going to provide significant assistance to the franchisee, then that meets the third part of the test and your franchise. So if you meet all of those, if your business model meets all of those three elements, then you're a franchise regardless of what the parties label the document. A license agreement, you can call it whatever you want, but if it's a franchise, it's a franchise and you're going to have to comply with the state and federal laws. Uh, at the state level, the laws that define franchising are pretty similar to the federal law. Uh, some states do not have the fee element, so uh, payment of any money, or don't have the $500 minimum. So, so for example, in Illinois, um, uh, the payment of any money might, might be considered a franchise, whereas under the federal law it might not. Um, and some state laws have different definitions of what constitutes a trademark element. Some use what's called a community of interest uh, definition. Other ones say that, well, if your, your business is substantially associated with the franchise or is trademark, then that, that constitutes the uh, trademark element. So you need to al analyze uh, how you're going to structure your business and whether or not it's going to be a franchise because a lot of times uh, I come across businesses that uh, say they're not a franchise, but they meet all three of the definitional elements of a franchise, and therefore they are, whether they like it or not, and they may be uh, what we call an unintentional franchise and may be violating both state and federal laws uh, by doing so. So you want to be careful that you structure your program. If it's a franchise, you're going to have to comply with the franchise laws. If you want to structure your program to avoid the franchise laws, there's ways to accomplish that as well, but you've got to be careful that you don't become an inadvertent franchisor. Now we're going to turn back to the business uh, side of, of franchising your business. And um, clients will come to me and say, well, you know, what do I need to do to start franchising? And probably the first thing I do, and it's not on the top of the list here, but it's second, is to register your trademark. And I say that's one of the first things to because, number one, the trademark is one of the most important uh, aspects of your business, one of the most important assets of your business, your trademark. So. Um, you want to register your trademark with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. You may have more than one trademark, um, but it takes a long time to get that whole process through. Most of the time it takes at least a year to get it uh, actually registered. So you want to start that process uh, right up front. The other uh, uh, thing you want to talk about uh, initially is a budget. So we need to figure out how much it's going to cost us to launch this franchise program. There's a, there's a lot of aspects to it. So for example, um, you're going to have legal fees to prepare the disclosure document and franchise agreement, perhaps state registration fees if you're going to be registering in the registration states. You may have a fee. You may have to pay someone to prepare the operations manuals that we talked about. Um, you're going to have expenses in um, selling the franchise, so marketing the franchises. You're going to have selling costs and marketing costs. Uh, so you need to create a budget and determine how much money am I going to need to, to to have to launch this program. Um, we talked about the training and operations manuals. You're going to need to 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 get those those completed. Uh, again, if you're going to hire a third party to do that, you're going to have to uh, budget about uh, two or three months. This is a significant project for someone to put together those uh, operations manuals. Uh, likewise, the website update. Uh, uh, that could take, you know, a month or longer, depending on, on how much work you're going to be doing and who you're hiring to do it. 
Uh, you're going to need to create those advertising and marketing materials we talked about. Uh, prepare the franchise disclosure document. Uh, clients ask me, okay, how much, uh, how long will it take? So I usually tell clients 60 to 90 days uh, to prepare the disclosure document, the franchise agreement, and get you at least lawfully offering franchises in the non-registration states, which there's about 37. So you can get, get going fairly quickly, uh, but you want to start all these, these steps as, as soon as possible. Um, in some cases, uh, you're also going to need to create some standardized construction plans or floor plans if, if you've got fixed location franchises, uh, so you want to get started on that. And then um, you may want to start negotiating uh, agreements with your suppliers to get the best prices for you and your franchisees. Uh, when you're, you're, you're operating your business uh, before you start franchising, you may not have the benefit of uh, higher purchasing. Uh, which will give you better pricing. So once you start franchising, you can start talking to, to vendors and, and start uh, negotiating better prices and, and let them know you're going to franchise and, and you're going to have uh, a lot more business for them. And I'll be glad to hear that. Next thing I want to talk about is what goes into the franchise business model. What do I need to think about from the business side um, to create this franchise? So I've got a list of a bunch of things here. The first thing we'll talk about is the initial franchise fee. So most franchisors charge an initial franchise fee, which can range anywhere from $5,000 uh, to $50,000 or more. From the franchisor's perspective, this initial franchise fee is typically uh, not a profit center. That is, uh, if the franchisor can recoup its selling costs and its training costs to get that franchisee up and running, then it's probably done, a, uh, done well. Uh, where the franchisor hopes to make its money, or should hope to make its money, is on the ongoing royalty fees. Okay, so most franchisors charge an ongoing royalty fee, which is usually either a percentage of gross sales or sometimes a flat fixed fee, weekly or monthly uh, or some other period of time. So the ongoing royalty fees, um, this is uh, something that you're going to give uh, serious consideration as to how much you're going to charge on an ongoing basis for royalties. Well, there's a couple of factors to, to consider. Uh, one would be your competition. Well, if you're in the restaurant business, uh, let's say your sub shop, and all the other sub shops are charging somewhere between 8 to 10 percent uh, royalty, if you charge 15 percent royalty, I think you're going to have a hard time selling franchises. If you sell with a 5 percent royalty fee, uh, you may be leaving some money on the table, so to speak, or you may not even be recouping enough money to make this whole franchise concept profitable for you. So you want to factor, you want, and the last thing you want to make sure is, uh, maybe the first thing, is that after paying the royalty fee to you, the franchisee can still make a good living. Because uh, the bottom line is in franchising, um, it only works if both the franchisor and the franchisee are making money, if they're both successful. A franchisor cannot succeed if its franchisees do not succeed. So your business model has to be good for both parties. And, and this is something that takes uh, some time and effort to, to figure out what is the right franchise fee, what is the right royalty fee. And um, again, there are, there are franchise consultants out there to help you with that process. Another factor to consider is whether or not you're going to have some sort of national or regional advertising program. Most franchisors today uh, charge their franchisee somewhere between 1 to 3 percent towards a advertising fund that the franchisor typically uh, controls to use for maybe television ads, radio ads, uh, print ads, national ads, regional ads. Etc. So as a franchisor, you need to figure out what is it that you, you would do with that money if you had it, if you were collecting it from franchisees, and what benefit is it going to give the franchisee, uh, because if it doesn't benefit the franchisees, I'm not sure why you're spending the money. So um, we're going to have to think about the advertising fund, whether we want to have one or not, and if so, how much to charge the franchisees for it. Another important business aspect to determine when you set up your business model, franchise model, is are you going to grant any exclusive territories to the franchisee? Uh, in many businesses, uh, most businesses, I guess a franchisee is going to want to know that you're not going to cannibalize, as, as they use the word in franchising, cannibalize their store and, and open up additional outlets that are going to compete with the franchisee and, and make him or her less successful. Um, so you want to consider what 
territory would be fair to both the franchisor and the franchisee such that the franchisee will have uh, a big enough market within which to sell its goods or services. Um, another uh, issue to, to consider in creating your business model is uh, what's the term of the agreement? I've seen agreements anywhere from two or three years to most of them are 10 years and most of them have uh, renewal rights, although I've seen some 20 years or, or longer as well. So how long uh, um, do you want to give the franchisee the right to, to operate the business and uh, do you want to give them uh, rights to renew and under what circumstances? Uh, another factor to consider in many businesses today is what kind of computer and hardware requirements you're going to impose upon the franchisee. Uh, so typically, for example, a restaurant franchise, uh, the franchisee is going to be required to purchase a particular brand of uh, POS system. Uh, the franchisor is going to have access to all of the information on that POS system and maybe as well on your, your back-end computers. Uh, you may have proprietary software that you're going to require the franchisee to utilize. In some uh, franchise systems, uh, the franchisor provides some of the, quote, back-end services, the billing and collection services. Uh, so you need to figure all of that for your, for your business and, and what is it that you're going to require the franchisee to, to have in terms of computer, hardware, and software. Uh, another factor to, continue, to, to consider is what uh, warranty um, you might give to the consumers and how one franchisee may be affected by a breach of warranty by another franchisee. So, for example, let's say it's a service business and there's a, a warranty on the service and the franchisee does a bad job. Um, maybe that consumer goes to another market and, you know, a, a, and wants the franchisee in the second market to fix what the uh, franchisee in the first market uh, messed up. Uh, so you need to address that in probably your operations manual, how you're going to handle warranty matters, uh, and similarly how you would handle things like gift cards. Because what if I buy a gift card in one location and use it in another location, how are the franchisees going to be compensated and how's the franchisor going to be compensated? So when you have gift cards and loyalty card programs, you're going to need to consider that. Um, another factor to consider, and this all goes into your franchise agreement, is uh, what are going to be the post-term, post term post termination obligations of the franchisee, meaning are you going to impose a non-compete on the franchisee after the franchise agreement expires or is terminated. Now keep in mind that in some states like California these non-competes may not be enforceable. So you have to be careful there um, and, and know uh, what your rights and obligations are before you enter into to another state. Another important factor to consider from the business side when you start franchising is how you're going to handle social media. Um, I've seen two different models. One is where the franchisor controls all of the social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, etc. Uh, and other franchise systems where the franchisor gives the franchisee the right to conduct its own social media programs. Um, I happen to prefer the local uh, franchisee handling the social media because social media by its nature is, is local. So, uh, but there may be reasons why a franchisor wants to control that and certainly even if you give the franchisee the right to conduct some social media, uh, you're going to have to or you're going to want to have a social media policy to prohibit the franchisee from posting objectionable material and things like that. So you want to control, uh, to a certain extent, to control your brand and your trademark, but you want to give the franchisee some flexibility that they can communicate with their market. Okay. And uh, lastly is in some, some franchise systems you're going to have to consider licensing requirements. Um, and, and what is it and how long is it going to take for the, for the franchisee to get all the necessary licenses to operate their business. So those are, are, are kind of the business issues that I think you need to focus on before you can really get too much, too, too far along in uh, franchising your business. So let's talk about marketing your franchise and selling franchises. Now there's a number of different ways that franchisors uh, sell franchises. The first and simplest is what we call a single unit franchise. So the franchisor is selling to a franchisee one unit at a time. That's it. The franchisee is uh, only able to open one unit. Um, this is the model that I recommend that my clients start with because it's the simplest and you're one-on-one -on -one with the franchisee. 
The second business model would be what they call multiple units. Uh, so again, a franchisor grants to one franchisee or one franchisee entity the right to open multiple stores or multiple territories under the franchisor's trademark. Um, so not too complicated, it's really just a single unit multiplied. Um, the next uh, way to grow your business is through what they call area development rights. Area development rights are where the franchisor grants to an area developer the right typically to operate one or more units in that territory and to sell or solicit prospective franchisees for the franchisor within that territory. And the area developer will typically provide some or all of the initial training and some or most of the ongoing assistance to the franchisee in his territory or her territory. Now the franchisor will compensate the area developer, area developer by sharing in both the initial franchise fee and the ongoing royalty fee. Maybe anywhere from 50-50 basis, 75-25 split or whatever, but this has become a very popular way of growing a franchise because you, what you now have is not only your own in-house salespeople, but you've got these area developers out there both opening their own stores or, or, or territories as well as soliciting new prospects in their territory. So this is a way to grow your business faster than individual units or multi-units. However, uh, I don't recommend you start out that way because you can wind up in a situation where the tail is wagging the dog, so to speak. Your area developer can get bigger than the franchisor sometimes, and that can create some uh, tensions there. Uh, an offshoot to the area development program would be what's called a area representative program, and that's really where the area developer is not operating any stores themselves. You're really just appointing a sales rep in a particular territory. Uh, this is not something I would recommend if you're going to hire people just to, quote, sell for you or, or get prospects for you, I think you're better off using a brokerage system than, than an area representative system. And finally, the last uh, model that we see in the franchise arena is something called sub-franchising or master franchising. Now, we typically reserve these for international transactions. Uh, what what, multi, what uh, sub-franchising or master franchising is, Basically, you get grant to the master franchisee or sub-franchisor the right to stand in your shoes in a territory. So they become the franchisor and they have to prepare their own disclosure documents and they have to sell and train and support the franchisees. And what the franchisor gets is a percentage of the ongoing, uh, the initial franchise fees and ongoing royalty fees. Um, there are a couple of systems here in the United States that use that. Uh, Fantastic Sam's has a system like that. We have a client, JanPro International, uh, does it that way. But typically that's reserved for international markets where the franchisor is really not going to have uh, the ability to uh, promote and to support franchisees uh, in, a, in a foreign country, in a foreign market. So those are the different models uh, that we use in franchising. So let's talk now about um, how do we market and sell franchises. Uh, traditionally, they were marketed and sold, I guess, uh, uh, through trade shows, and we still have trade shows today. The Inter International Franchise Association uh, has trade shows, and there, there's, there's others out there. Franchising one-on-one -on -one is a client of mine. They do franchise shows. Um, but that's fairly expensive. I mean, you have a booth fee, you have travel expenses, you have people sitting there ma manning the booth. Uh, but that's one option is, is trade shows. Uh, another option uh, typically would be the uh, print media. So uh, Wall Street Journal um, has one day a week where they, they advertise franchises for sale. USA Today has franchises for sale. So most, most of your uh, print publications uh, would have it, magazines, trade magazines. Uh, again, to, to, for me, it's a fairly expensive way of, of advertising and marketing your, your franchise. So today, the last you know, 10, 15 years, we have the internet. So the internet is, is probably, um, probably the number one. I read these franchise magazines and try to figure out how people are saying, for selling franchises. And, and, and the internet is uh, certainly a big part of your marketing program. 
Um, but certainly you, you can't rely solely on the internet. And uh, finally, uh, another way franchises are sold are through franchise brokers. So there's franchise brokerage firms like FranNet and Entrepreneur Source and, and firms like that. And what they do is they uh, will try to find and recruit franchisees for a franchisor. They are paid, these brokers are paid by the franchisor, um, uh, usually a percentage of the initial franchise fee. So those are, so those are the way we market franchises. Um, next I want to talk about uh, what is the process, how does it all work from, from start to end. So let's say you get a, an inquiry, someone's uh, interested in buying a franchise from you and maybe you got the inquiry off of the internet, maybe at a trade show, wherever. One of the first things you want to kind of want to do is have that prospect fill out an application because the you need to be uh, screening the franchisee just as the franchisee should be screening you. Um, so you want to have an application form, they fill out some basic information, you want to know a little bit about the, the, the person's background, what their skills are, you're certainly going to need to know their financial situation um, because at some point you're gonna, in, in your disclosure document you're going to create what we call the initial investment, it's a, it's a chart that shows what the initial investment is going to be for the franchisee to get up and running for the first three months. So let's say that number is, uh, and you give a range, it's two hundred dollars to $250,000. And if you get an application from a franchisee and you see they've got $100 in, in savings and uh, $2,000 in an IRA um, and a credit score of you know, five hundred. dollars well, they're probably not going to be able to come up with the two or two hundred fifty thousand dollars that's going to be required to start the business. So you need to qualify the franchisee financially as well as from from a uh, personal point of view. You're going to want a, a personal interview at some point. Um, so this, it all starts with this application. Um, so typically, again, the inquiry comes in, uh, and you'll have a whole sales process, hopefully, where you uh, um, have these different touch points with these prospects. So. Uh, but the first one might be where you send them the application. The next would be um, once they fill out the application and they're still interested and you're still interested, you would usually have uh, uh, send him the franchise disclosure document. Uh, and again, you want to start the 10, I'm sorry, the 14, it used to be 10 days, I'm still in, in, in the old days, a 14 calendar day cooling off period. Um, uh, so you want to get that started kind of as soon as possible. Uh, so you're going to give the franchisee a franchise disclosure document. Um, if both parties are still interested, you're usually then going to have what's called a discovery day where the franchisee is going to come to the franchisor's headquarters and meet the uh, principals and operational people uh, of the franchisor because up until then the franchisee has only been de dealing with the franchisors development personnel or the salespeople. So now the franchisee has an opportunity to come to the franchisors headquarters, meet everybody else and, and get a better feel for the franchise and a better feel for both parties whether or not there's a fit um, to move forward. And um, if, if, if both parties are ready to move forward then you would, you would have a closing, the franchisee signs a franchise agreement and that franchise agreement will govern the relationship between the franchisor and the franchisee from that day forward. Okay, so um, now that we have sold a franchise, I just want to touch on a, a few things about the ongoing relationship between the franchisor and the franchisee. As I said, the franchise agreement governs the relationship from a legal point of view with the franchisor can and cannot do, franchisee can and cannot do. Uh, but more importantly than the legal issues in this relationship is the business issues in the relationship. And that is, um, I've had all kinds of clients, uh, good franchisors and bad franchisors. And I see it from both sides representing uh, franchisees as well from time to time. And what I, what I like to um, encourage uh, my franchisor clients is to recognize the time, effort, and money that the franchisee puts in to helping to build your business. 
And what I see quite often, unfortunately, is franchisors that are concerned more with you know, getting their royalty fees from the franchisee and not worrying about is the franchisee successful or not, is the franchisee following systems or not. Um, so this is a bit, big pet peeve of mine. Uh, and again, there, there's good franchisors and bad ones out there, but I, I like to think that my franchisor clients uh, do a better job or will do a better job if they understand um, the plight of the franchisee, if you will. Um, they're typically going to be hardworking and the franchisor needs to help them to be successful. Because as I said before, if the franchisee is not successful, the franchisor is not going to be successful. And in fact, one or two bad franchisees can spoil a system, uh, particularly early on. So when you're selling your first franchises, it is very important to be selective. And I, I harp on this with my clients. Um, you know, some franchisors will sell a franchise to anyone who comes up with the initial franchise fee. They're happy. They got their $25,000 and they don't care what happens thereafter. Well, obviously that's very short-sighted. So um, you really need to, to support the franchisees. Now, if they're not doing their job, then, then it is the franchisor's job to, to step in and, and, and correct it. Um, so you have to have a little bit of a balance in, in, okay, you want to protect your trademark and you want to protect your brand and you want to make sure the franchise is doing everything that they're supposed to do. But on the other hand, you need to help them to achieve that because it's really, really a partnership and um, it doesn't work one without the other. So I want you to, to, to keep that in mind if you're a franchisor. You, you, if, if you have a failure, by the way, the franchise disclosure document requires the franchisee, franchisor to list all franchisees in the system as well as those franchisees who have left the system within a certain period of time after the end of the year. So the franchisee prospect is going to have the ability to call some of your former franchisees and find out why it is they're no longer a franchise. Now maybe it's because they were successful and they sold their business, or maybe it's because they were unsuccessful, or maybe it was because the franchisor you know, terminated them, um, and you're going to hear from that former franchisee uh, why they think they were terminated. So it's uh, the only way this business model works, this franchise business model works, is if both parties can be successful. And I, and I encourage you to always keep that in mind if you're going to franchise your business. So thank you for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to call. My number is up on the screen, uh, email address, website address, and uh, be happy to talk to anyone about franchising. I have a passion for it, enjoy it, and um, good luck. Thank you.